Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Simmons Comics, and we are back with another top 10 back issues for you to be on the lookout for. That's right, we give you a top 10 every week, but really, this is one major list that you can keep adding to. Isn't that right, Jack? That's right. This living bolo buy list keeps growing with each and every week. And we appreciate your support checking out each and every video. And this thing is growing, getting bigger and bigger. And there are a lot of key issues to be on the lookout for. So we got another 10 fresh issues to talk about this week. Yeah, so do us a favor, click that thumbs up button. Also want to appreciate everyone that comments week in and week out. And for those of you guys in the live chat right now, Thank you so much for joining us, as well as those that listen to this on the audio version. But with that being said, we're going to get into it right now, starting with number 10. Coming in at our 10th spot on this list is a book and a series we've talked about plenty of times, as well as this publisher. But we are talking about Once in Future number one. Yeah, now see, this list, uh, and not just... When I say this list, again, I don't mean this week. I mean this list in general, the, these lists that we've been putting together of uh, books to be on the lookout for. There's been trends throughout. And one trend that we have not seen is a whole lot of independent comics. And that's because of the market right now. It's really tough to project long term. We love independent comics. On a week to week basis, when we're talking about those new releases uh, for New Comic Book Day, the, the releases that more often catch Brian and my eye, not just for reading and enjoyment, but also for investment sake, a lot of them tend to be those independent releases. But when you're trying to project long term, it's tough because you got to find the right buying cycle. We're going to see some independent releases coming on the list, and they all fit into the perfect time in the buying cycle, except maybe a couple of these Boom releases because Boom Studios just did a big deal with Netflix, and people are starting to get excited. But we're starting to see some of those prices start to drop from their highs from the announcement. And what I'm using is the highs from the announcement as an indicator for which series are the most popular with fans and right off the bat once in future is one to be on the lookout for it's affordable because they essentially double ship the first issue cover a it, it was part of the boom guarantee program they were returnable a lot of stores had them even far beyond the sellout and because of that prices have stayed deflated but the potential for this series is just immense and it's a reason to be on the lookout cover a all those late printings the great incentives the one per store the dan mora variant so much cool stuff but that cover a is a sleeper right and also like he said what we thought were the best for that boom netflix we also have a top 10 video yep for what we think the best boom titles are for that Netflix deal. We'll put a card up on the screen right now, as well as a link into the description. And I think our next book on the list is on there as well. And then hitting the list at number nine this week, we're talking about Something is Killing the Children. This is a series we've also talked about. I can't get enough of this. I've read this. I've read the floppies. I've read the trade paperback. And this seems to be like one of those titles, even though this list was created weeks ago, it's nothing hotter right now. This probably would have been moved up on the list because something is killing children. It's definitely moving and one to be on the lookout for. Yeah, definitely we would have done this one probably week one had we had any idea of what was going to happen with Boom and Netflix. And then what, you know, this book being popular and maybe the most popular of all of the Boom Netflix titles, totally predictable because it's the most popular with us. It's the one that catch you or my attention. And we've been talking Erica Slaughter now since last year's convention season. So because of that, this is just a no-brainer one. Now, there's a lot of spiking prices. So you can see like issues four and five, shout out to Andy Tomlin from the Indie Spotlight series who has really highlighted these on Instagram. Um, those FOC variants featuring Erica Slaughter, the Virgin covers, they are doing incredibly well, like $30. But issue number one is, to my opinion, still incredibly undervalued. The Frizen is like $10. Some of the other covers are 10 or slightly less. Um, I think that's a good buy because this character, and, and when you're looking at film and television, it's so character driven. This character of Erica Slaughter is straight money. I got to believe that they can put an entire vehicle behind her. And it's a character that I could see a major celebrity wanting to play. Now, number nine and 10, we had some more modern comics, but we're taking it back to old school at number eight, and we are talking about showcase number 80. We've gotten comments on some of our list about this issue, and we just kept saying, be patient, right? Yeah, so this is the one where we almost have to stop this list right here and go, 
here you go. Because th this has by far been the most requested book, which is something I find funny. And that's great information. And that's why we want to share that with you. The most consistent book I saw in the comment thread was Showcase 80. And, and why, because, why, why Showcase 80? It's because everybody's excited about Justice League Dark. That's something we, a trend we have pointed out numerous times on numerous programs. And because of that, we see the same keys, right, with Justice League Dark. But what people aren't paying attention to is the Phantom Stranger. Now, this is a classic, classic character, but a character who got kind of revitalized by becoming a part of the early incarnation of what would later be known as Justice League Dark. Because of that, I think a lot of people are hopeful, at least, and at least it's a, a, a solid shot that Phantom Stranger is going to be used in whatever HBO Max uh, Justice League Dark show we end up getting. But here's the thing. Phantom Stranger being a Golden Age character kind of falls into that trend that we've been talking about, Brian, right here on this program with the fact that those books are so far out of most collectors' affordability and the characters so often don't reflect what they see modern in not just print media, but what will eventually be on screen that they're just not probably the prime investment to make for, for this kind of a play. And this being the first silver age phantom stranger, the, also the beautiful cover art, I think really play into why this book is the book to get. If you're looking at phantom stranger. Then at number seven, staying with DC showcase, we are talking about showcase number 34. This is a book that saw a rise recently with those CW shows. It's always been a key nonetheless, but we also have great first appearance in this book, right? Right. You're talking about the Ray Palmer, Adam. Definitely saw a spike when we got Ray Palmer on the CW. Um, now we've seen the exit of Ray Palmer. So that may be a time when these books start to kind of drop in value, but you're talking about amazing cover art, a silver age key, a major first appearance. The Blue Beetle is a character similar to Marvel's Ant-Man, has unlimited potential. We've seen what Ant-Man's been able to do. Also, the Atom played really well and was a good part of the Team Arrow CW universe for a number of years. So it really showed the potential. And we've talked about that, that on this show, where you've got to kind of look for different indicators of what future potential would be. This is a character with great potential. And you're talking about a 10-cent comic, so they're not going to be making more. So at $100 right now, expensive, yes, but a book to be on the lookout for because the potential for this book is unlimited. So look for this one in that hundred dollar mid mid grade range. That would be my suggestion. You can go a little lower, but the, you start to get rough on the grades. Then coming at number six on our list this week, we have that Marvel super special number 16. Just hearing that name, you might not be aware of it, but it reprints Star Wars issues number 39 to 44, covering that whole Empire Strikes Back storyline. Some people might be like, oh, those are all reprinted issues, but this is still a great book, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, this is a book that has been chased regularly by collectors as it reprints Boba Fett's first appearance. And you got to realize at this time, Marvel was still dual releasing these Star Wars issues through the magazine style uh, that's represented with this book, as well as through the regular monthly floppy issue. So we tend to look at these as reprints and late printings, but it was really the distribution style of Marvel at the time. And especially how they use the various movie titles. This was a marketing around that Empire Strikes Back movie. So we're talking about the first appearance of Boba Fett, which is why this book has always really been relevant. It's always kind of been looked at as kind of a 1B in the whole first appearance of Boba Fett. Obviously, Star Wars 40 is the book to get. 42, excuse me, is the book to get. Um, but this has always been looked at as that 1B where it, it's kind of always been in demand. But then as new collectors come into the hobby, it's regularly one that kind of people have to educate themselves on. They may well, it's not just be, a great cover. And then yeah. all the other Strikes Back characters, you're also getting Lando Calrissian in there. Right. That was my next point. Yoda yeah. from issue 41. So you're really looking at a lot packed into this one book and a book right now that trades regularly anywhere from 20 to 30 dollars um but it's a book that you can find at conventions sitting in those like five dollar magazine boxes regularly um so it's definitely one to be on the lookout for and it's one we want to make sure that like every now and again we talk about because people may not be aware of its existence and you brought up a good point in talking about the magazine boxes this is a magazine sized book yeah. right 
Yeah, yeah. Magazine size book, um, definitely wider and taller. Um, so if you're looking for this book at, at shows or at your shop, whenever this thing comes back around, look in those magazine boxes. So here we are, guys. We are halfway through the list right now. Do us a favor, comment down below. Do you have any of these books? What do you think about our list so far? And of course, do us a thumbs up. And if you have friends that might be interested in this list, please be sure to share this out to them as well. And with that being said, we are getting into number five. And then coming in at number five, we have that Marvel Star 1986 Master of the Universe number one. Now, if you know me, you know when I saw this list, I got a big old smile on my face because I'm a huge Master of the Universe fan. And this is a great issue. Yes, we know there's a three-issue miniseries from DC from 82. We also know about that DC Presents number 47. But this is a great book that will eventually start being picked up by collectors as they can't get those other ones. Right, Jack? Well, what we're looking for, Brian, is you're looking for the book that best represents Masters of the Universe. This is a title and a property that's been passed along through several different publishers. And this really, this pick speaks to a larger trend. Now, we've said it on this show, what we're aiming to do is identify certain trends that we see happening in the future of the hobby. So one that we talked about in 2019 is reader buzz will drive secondary market demand. I feel like we saw that. We talked about IDW and boom will make a major play on the secondary market. We saw that. Now we're talking about these later printings. We're talking about these Netflix option deals. We're talking about these iconic covers. We're talking about these cameo appearances. And this is another trend that Brian and I are both extremely bullish on. And that's 80s and 90s kind of cartoon toy nostalgia driving some of these media properties going forward beyond 2020. Because Hollywood, they're looking for new IP constantly. And nostalgia is selling on every front. And as Marvel has already kind of carved their area, every other movie company is looking for competition. Paramount has honed in on that Hasbro universe and Masters of the Universe has been one of the most talked about properties with new toy lines, new cartoons, new anime coming to Netflix, so much on the horizon. It's really hard not to be bullish about this, this property. So this is a trend we think in general we're going to see. We're going to see whether it's G.I. Joe, Transformers, Masters of the Universe, Thundercats, all of these are properties that we're paying attention to. But Masters of the Universe is one of those ones, one of the first ones we got to talk about. And then if you're trying to make your pick, like you said, Brian, there's a lot of different choices to go with. But to me, this is the quintessential Masters of the Universe run. This is the quintessential Masters of the Universe book. Right. You also just heard Jack talk about toys and cartoons. This weekend, we're going to drop two videos, two new top tens. We're talking about top 10 comics based on toys, as well as top 10 comics based on cartoons. So make sure you subscribe and click that bell notification so that way you'll be notified when those videos hit the channel. Coming in next on our list at number four, this is a book that a lot of people are well aware of. And we're talking about that Incredible Hulk annual number one iconic cover. Yeah, I kind of let the cat out of the bag, Brian, because when I was talking about trends we're paying attention to, I actually let one slip that we hadn't gotten to yet, and that is cool covers. And this one, cool doesn't describe it. It's truly iconic. Yeah. It's been swiped how many times? How many? It, it, uh, you can't even count. It's one of those go-to popular cover swipes. But I still feel like this book is undervalued. It, it's a book that's classic. But we live in a new era of comic collector. This is the key collector era. And I'm not talking about the app, but the app certainly aids in that. That's where that name and that whole concept comes from. This is the, the era of collectors looking for key issues. And when they, what they define as keys has been dwindled down. So no longer are, when we were kids, some epic battle. For instance, Wolverine number three versus silver samurai that was a key because that was an epic battle between wolverine and silver samurai that's not a key anymore a key is pretty much dwindled down to first appearances and then they've divided that up amongst your cameos first fulls and everything else in between so what has ended up happening is because everything's first appearance driven these classic characters i'm talking about incredible hulk i'm talking about iron man i'm talking about avengers they have begun to price very 
difficult for the average consumer. Brian, I know you've got a first appearance of Avengers hanging on your wall, but that was one you made sure you grabbed a couple of years ago because it's only going to go up. It's only going to become more and more attainable, unattainable for a lot of people. And people are going to start looking for other options. So when we're talking about Incredible Hulk, and obviously, you know, the first appearance is tough, a tough buy for most people. They're going to start looking in other directions. One area they're going to look is Incredible Hulk 102, which re retells the origin. It's the start of the Incredible Hulk series. But I really think the other one is this annual, and I think it has a stronger chance than 102 because of this iconic Storenko cover. And I think as Storenko, who, you know, is an absolute legend in our industry, but as he continues to age, I, I don't think people yet have an appreciation for how iconic some of his artwork is. Yeah, it doesn't have like the first appearance of like the League of Evil and Humans or something that it also is, but Yeah, there is a there is a first appearance in the book, but it's not one of those first appearances that's ever really been talked about. God forbid it ends up being a first appearance that, that spikes. That would be the type of thing that would send this book to the stratosphere. But you don't need a first appearance for this book. This is just classic Steranko amazing art. So we are down to the top three this week. And coming in at number three, we have another twofer for you. Jack just talked about Jim Stranko. And here we have Nick Fury, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. issues number one and number four. Two more iconic Stranko covers. That's right. So the reason really why number one holds, you know, so much weight is that it's the first Nick Fury, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. solo series. And Nick Fury, obviously, while he looks a bit different these days, um, is such a key character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and everything Marvel right now. Um, but either way, even if it had nothing to do with Nick Fury in the movies, even if you want to try to tell me, oh, it's the ultimate Nick Fury, it's a different Nick Fury. It's Hasselhoff Nick Fury. <laughs> yeah, regardless, whatever, whatever argument we want to get into, this is such a classic and iconic cover and issue number four, another classic and iconic cover that really not only defines Storenko, but really defines the character of Nick Fury. I mean, for Especially so many, it was right in the middle of the, like, the heart of James Bond movies, right? Yeah, for so many years, this is what we saw. And, and it, it was definitely, it was kind of our American James Bond within the Marvel Universe and has kind of evolved and developed into this great character who kind of is, it, not kind of, is absolutely the glue that holds together the Marvel Universe. So these are great and iconic books. There's no risk when you buy these books, right? They're not going to go down in value. The only thing you could ever say to me is because there's not, again, some major key tied to them, they won't matriculate in value kind of overnight with some like stellar plunge because of some first appearance announcement. Even if they do a Nick Fury solo movie, I don't know that these books would ever really spike hard because of the difference between Samuel L. Jackson and this Nick Fury that's depicted here. Doesn't matter. These are blue chips. They're always going to go up in value as the overall comics market goes up in value. And on top of that, these are classic keys to have in your collection and when i say keys i mean keys in that classic sense these were books that when i first got into comics everybody wanted and now you don't see people talking about so because of that they're kind of undervalued yeah and it's kind of crazy because if you think about comics right now the comic collectors right now one of the top people they'll mention is donny cates if you were to rewind back to the time period where these books came out you always heard Jim Starenko's name being announced with all these covers for, especially he was like the working man as the artist, as Donny Cates is the author for books right now. But either way, Great Issues, also number four, has a reworked origin story that was taken out of Strange Tales number 135. Which <laughs> then coming in our second to top spot this week, we have Web of Spider-Man number one. One, this was a classic book that you would see a lot, especially when I was growing up, first getting into comics as a kid. You always saw this book. We talked about iconic covers on this list. This is one of the ones as a kid that I just had to have. I probably own multiple copies throughout different periods of my life, but a lot of people say, well, there's a lot of them out there. Well, it's still a great book, isn't it? Yeah, and it's spiking currently in the market right now, and I can't honestly figure out why. I mean, I saw it this week. It was on the Key Collector Top 20 list uh, with multiple, multiple hundreds of percent increase in sales. 
But for the life of me, I really don't know why. But I think people are starting to get hit to the whole reason I put it on the list. It's the, really the same reason I'm talking about Nick Fury or Hulk. Thing. We're talking about Spider-Man, an iconic character. Owning a Spider-Man number one, owning an Amazing Fantasy 15, so difficult for so many people. Beyond that, while this is a very tough book to compare to either of those books, it's a book that really was important in a lot of people's childhood. When I was growing up um, as a child, I didn't necessarily know the difference between Amazing Spider-Man, Web of Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, or just the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man. To me, they were all Spider-Man books. I didn't really see one as better than the other. So growing up, Web of Spider-Man kind of has a special place in my heart. And I think it does with a lot of people of a certain age and of a certain era. And that number one issue, it's one of those books that like, it's an iconic cover. We've all seen it. Um, It reminds me of a book that has been sitting not on the wall, but in those boxes like we talk about. And you see it and maybe you've passed over it dozens of times maybe maybe you bought one for your collection maybe uh you never thought about investing and grabbing some in because you, you didn't realize it might matriculate but this is a book that's like quadrupled in value over the last several years and i just think it's going to be a slow gainer over time because spider-man books aren't going to get cheaper they're not going to be easier to get these vintage keys and as again this generation comes into financial power these books from the 80s even the early 80s are going to be books to be on the lookout for i also think you could check out spectacular spider-man number one for the same reason but also this web of spider-man you get that great and iconic black suit right on the cover and i think that makes a big difference yeah, you talked about seeing this and how much is appreciated. I've noticed the graded 9.8 copies have definitely appreciated. Yeah. But keep an eye on those eBay auctions because every now and then you'll see one slipping in there. Yeah. And you can get a CBCS 9.8 for fairly cheap. So we are here. We are at the top spot. And coming in at number one this week, we have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But wait. We're not talking about IDW, we're talking about OG Mirage, and we're not talking about any of them, we're talking about the late printings, right? Yes, see this is the thing. This is a cross-section of so many trends, Brian, that we're talking about. We're talking about these cartoon properties, these toy properties, these nostalgic 80s and 90s properties. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is just perfection, hits that nail on the head to a T. Now, We're talking about late printings and the fact that they've been slept on in the hobby for a number of years. Nowhere is that more prevalent than these early Mirage TMNT issues. I think a lot of people haven't even seen these covers. There's really only one issue that's really come to light recently, and that's issue number four, the recalled cover that had 90% of the print run recalled and only about a a thousand copies made it out to the public. And that book has seen recent spikes because it's a ghost. And, that book people love, but have kind of overlooked the fact that issue number one, while people know the second print looks exactly like the first print, uh, they don't realize that there's a, a third print with a new cover. They don't realize that issue number two has a second and a third print, all with new covers. That issue number three, four, five, six, and seven, as well as the final issue in the Mirage line, all have new covers for late printings. And some of these covers are absolutely incredible from the close-up of Krang to the incredible kind of painted wraparound style of a lot of these books. The classic TMNT back when they had the four red bandanas, back in the days of the comic being printed in black and white, it was all about these covers. And these are books that they kind of hit a couple things and there's a, a couple different negatives people could bring up. They don't sell for a ton of money. Absolutely not. But they're also not really available. So my thing is, I think this is an education situation, Brian. I think a lot of people aren't aware that these books exist. This Ninja Turtle series saw crazy print run spikes. Obviously, the first issue with a 2000 print run for the first print and then saw explosive numbers in the later prints, as well as the later issues going up to as much as 200,000 per issue. So that may scare some people off. But we're talking about more than 30 years later, one of the most iconic properties that there absolutely is in all of pop culture. And you can just do a little check for yourself. Check your favorite comic websites. Check eBay. You will not see a a plethora of these books available. There are some low-hanging fruit. There are some affordable copies out there. 
And it is my take that we as a community should be buying these books up. Because I think that once kind of whatever low hanging fruit you can find, whatever kind of copies exist out there on the market are affordable, get bought up, you are going to see these books become ghosts and you're going to start to see a lot of them go up in value a lot. And another book to pay attention to and be on the lookout for is that Raphael one shot, that micro series. It's famously known as Casey Jones first appearance. And there's a second print which features Raphael and Casey Jones on a rooftop. It's another one that I've found cheap as low as $5 in a bin can regularly bring you 30 or $40, but even there, I think it's undervalued. So there it is guys. There's the top 10 for this week. Once again, this full list is also available at our newly revamped overhauled, Brand new look website at simplebandscomics.com. So make sure you guys check that out. We also have links there to all the available copies for the books on this list on eBay. Full disclosure, those are affiliate links. So if you buy from there, that does support the channel and we get a couple pennies per sale. But either way, guys, let us know what you think about the list. Make sure you comment down below. Of course, click that thumbs up button. And once again, this weekend, we will have those top 10 toys and top 10 cartoon comic series. So make sure you're subscribed up. Click that notification. This is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics. See you guys in the next video.